Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sitting with uh, Lucy Sexton and Charles Atlas, um, two longtime artists who live in, the, in, the, in what was called Greenwich Village. And we are actually in Lucy's home, which is a throwback to what, <laughs> how artists used to live in this neighborhood when it was affordable for artists. That said, we're here to talk about a film that's going to debut tonight. Uh, I think it's the first time in the United States, of, and it's been shown very, very uh, few places, of uh, Anthony Haggerty, Anth Anthony and the Johnsons, uh, touring project called Turning. And um, we're not going to talk to Anthony today, but we're going to talk with his producer and longtime friend Lucy Saxon, and his director and the director of the film, Charles Atlas, also a longtime friend and collaborator of Anthony. Many people don't know the backstory of Anthony, that he actually did uh, live here for more than 10 years, um, pretty much ignored by the press, pretty much ignored by the gay community, pretty much ignored by the music community, but very much involved in the art world and fashion world and little performances. And you guys know him from that time, don't you? Sure. So when did you first meet Anthony, Charles? Can I call you Charlie or Charles? I want to be Charlie. Four. Charlie, okay. Uh, I first met Anthony, I think, in 1992. Um, I mean, I, I saw him at a, some kind of benefit um, concert, uh, you know, mixed bill, and he it was he and Johanna and Poison Eve. And they Poison were the, Eve. They were the they were the three. Okay. The three people, Black Lips. Okay. They were the oh, sort of, black, they, they were the core. Lips. They were the core before Black Lips became okay. a, a thing. So this is pre Black Lips. Black Lips. Well, it was just at the beginning of Black Lips, but before it became a. Well, let's a, let's a define larger. Black Lips for people. That was Black a, Lips was a, a sort of a collective of people around Johanna and Anthony who started it really, uh, of. The full, performers. the full title is Black Lips Performance, Performance Cult, Cult. And, it was, and it performed, that's when Charlie, when I uh, became aware of uh, Anthony was through Black Lips because Charlie would bring me to the Pyramid and they had, it was every Monday, Every right? Monday night. So every Monday midnight. they would make a new show and it was this collection. And of, it was an homage to whom? To Betty. Um, Betty, the English drag performance I know Betty, company. Betty Bourne. Betty Bourne, but Anthony has said that, that Black Lips, in his mind, came out as a continuation of the work that Betty, what was Blue Betty's? Lips. Blue Lips. Uh -huh. a Blue Lips. Um, and um, so there's well, a real... One, one of the things, I mean, when I first met Anthony, he was very involved, he was very, you know, avid uh, pursuer of the history of drag in New York. And, uh, and, in, and in broader sense, I mean, Blue Lips is really from London, but Anyway, it was in New York. The, the whole tradition of New York drag. And, and, and one of his icons was Marsha P. Johnson, Absolutely. who he named the, his band after. Marsha P. Johnson was a street drag, uh, African-American um, street walker uh, who was at the very beginning of gay liberation and, uh, and was someone that had a great impact on Anthony. So we've established that you guys all knew him for a long time, okay? And, uh, and Charlie, you collaborated with him a number of times. I'm, I'm leading up to talking about turning, yeah. but I just want to No, get I, we never really collaborated. I, I started, co you know, I used to go to the shows, and we were friends for a long time, and we used to go out together, and we were, we were good friends. And uh, I was always a supporter of his of Black Lips and especially Anthony, a contribution to it. And um, uh, you were yeah. well known as a as a, a video artist, uh, who whose a lot of his work was around dance dance and Merce Cunningham and performance and, and performance well. art. And and you had I mean you were quite visible um, and acknowledged within that world as one of the masters, the young masters of that genre of, of documentation and creation. Uh, am I correct? Yeah. <laughs> Don't be modest. Uh, but I mean, you are, you are responsible, uh, in my book, for really the legacy of Merce Cunningham. Mm -hmm. and, and your work has been shown around the world uh, of, 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 with Merce. You were good friends with Merce Cunningham? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was very lucky at a young age to be got associated with Merce Cunningham, just by luck. 
Well, I always think of Charlie's uh, uh, work, and it's funny thinking of it at this time, that he had these double lives, that he had this parallel life. Because I came up as a dancer, and the first time I saw Merce Cunningham, with all these, all the, in you know, the mid-70s, every piece was like originally a, a video dance work with Charles Atlas, and now it was a live work. So that's why I became aware of Charlie. Um, on the other hand, when you're talking about this time period of intersecting with Anthony, you know, Charlie was known as someone who went out to the clubs every night and who was would videotape every performance that happened at the Pyramid and lots of uh, clubs. And I think also, you know, you were, uh, Lee was very much around at that time. And well, I, that was after I, Lee you know, Valerie. when I, I went, I, you know, after, uh, le you know, uh, leaving, working for Merce all the time, I went, went was independent. I was working in Europe a lot, and I was started working with Michael Clark, and I made that film. And Michael I, came here for like a year. He came here for a year to work with uh, Carol Armitage and myself, and and um, and then. Uh, and, and, yeah, and, and actually, the whole idea, the whole notion of once a night clubs came from London. You know, named nights. And that, that, I was introduced to that with Michael and Lee. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back to New York, I sort of found a similar scene mm -hmm. that, I mean, I really wasn't part of. I, had, I performed at the Pyramid with Reese Chatham in the really, really, really early days yeah. with Reese and Carol. I did a film thing with them, and, um, and then I went to London. And, but when I came back, the Pyramid was already like whispers it was going. Full and, Mm -hmm. well, once, Bobby full Bradley, once Bobby Bradley left, it, it became, I mean, it continued, but it became like the second stages of Max's Kansas City. Mm -hmm. in yeah, yeah. So, but did you ever perform at Danceteria? Did you? I had, I had videos shown there, but yeah. I didn't And Lucy, you came out of uh, PS, <laughs> I, I, I first think I first knew of you from PS 122. Sure. Because you were one of the stable of, of, of sort of house artists that would perform there in the early days when John Byrne, Mm -hmm. Beautiful John Byrne, yep. who we miss, miss enormously. Still, and, yep. and, uh, so, okay, so here you both have your feet and your brains and your creativity grounded in, um, in a sense, that, that, that wonderful period of um, serious fun, meaning art uh, in clubs, um, high art meets low art, that kind of concept, which sure. I always felt was really important. And so, that, so you have grounded in your background is an appreciation for, for the other, for the other, which is certainly where Anthony comes from. Turning uh, is, a, is a documentation of a concert tour of what, four or five dates in Europe? It never played yeah. the United States? Ten, yeah, ten, no dates in the, we had done Turning well, you, well, you started talking about when Charlie and Anthony had collaborated, and certainly Turning is one of the first big collaborations. Which, the first co which was a live show. Which was a live show at St. Anne's in New in York. Brooklyn. They did do Turning at, at St. Anne's. It was Anne. part of the Whitney Biennial 2004. Okay. And we had, it was your project? No, it was Anthony's right. project, and I was invited in. Okay. And I wasn't sure, you know, it was, we, we talked about doing a collaboration, and I wasn't really ready to do it. And then he, everyone was like, yeah, yes, we have to do it now. And I was like, Okay, you know, we'll try. And this is after he won the Mercury Award? No, before. This is before he won the Mercury Award. So this the art world was already recognizing Anthony. I mean, this was the first big... 2004? I mean, 2004, April. Um, April 2004. And I had started doing live video things in 2003. Uh, of a very primitive... I did something with Douglas Dunn. And then I did a show at uh, Participant. And that, so this is the third thing that I've done with live video. Explain what you mean by live video as, a, for, for, as a, from an artist's point of view. Well, live video means working with, uh, in real time, doing, uh, creating in real time from live video sources. And so I was doing portraits, basically, live video portraits where I would shoot the you know, people would bring something, either they would, I would talk to them or they would bring a performance or something in front of a camera. I would have shoot them with two cameras and do live mixing at the same time and it would be projected in a separate space. Oh. So that was the, that was the basically what I did with turning. But, and I had also, uh, several years previously, I had been working with Revolving Platform 
and I'm not putting people on a revolving platform, shooting them with two cameras and with the delay, mixing the images. So that's, and I had done that with Johanna. I've been working ever since I met, when I first met um, Anthony, I was also like completely fascinated. Let's interested. talk about Johanna for a moment so our, so our audience knows who we're talking about. Joanna? Johanna Constantine was was Anthony's longtime artistic collaborator from the very beginning. They went to college together. They went to college together? Oh. In California. Cal Arts? Uh, no, uh, San... Someplace. Santa, Santa, not Santa... Something. I, you know, someplace. I, some, someplace out there. They found each other. Yeah, they in that found other each place. other. Johanna right? has a great story, so you have to ask her. It's, it's she, like, she saw him on a bus, and she liked like this baby blue coat he had on. So she started talking to him and basically followed him. <laughs> she's very home. visual. She she followed him. She she, she uh, kind of stalked him. <laughs> <laughs> they became best friends and collaborators. I mean, they can tell the story much better. But Johanna is a dancer and performer and does amazing uh, body art, visual transformations of herself, covering herself with uh, full body makeup and creating bits of armor that cover uh, parts of her body and doing dance performances um, and she would do them at Black Lips and, and I don't know if she still does but for a long time would open every one of Antony's shows with a Johanna dance. And she sort of deconstructed the concept of beauty mm. because in fact she was very beautiful sure. but it was not in any sense conventional but it was stunning at the same time. Mm. Uh, well I mean and that's, that's where it crossed over with Lee Bari. Um, because I mean, let's I, bring Lee into this picture. Well, because I, this I, is Lee was one of my best friends, and I, I met him through Michael, and then we became really good friends. And I worked with Lee, and he used to come to New York all the time. He would stay with me, and I would stay with him in London. And on one of his trips to New York, I brought him to see Black Lips, and he was, you know, he was loved it, and he was completely, especially loved Johanna. And in fact, one, you know, when he met her, he kind of like copied one of her looks you know, briefly. <laughs> um, and she also with him. Of course, he was already an icon for them. Um, and and the, the concept of transformation of the body in real time mm -hmm. into something else in real time, uh, Joanna did the, does that. Mm -hmm. Lee certainly was the master of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's funny. The stuff of Lee's that I love the most are the Lucian Freud portraits mm -hmm. because I think that even stripped away of all of the artifice and, and fantasy, there is this transgressive human being that, that oh, radiates well, he, he off staged the canvas. Those, he staged those poses. Yeah. Another person that AIDS took from this community far too early. And of course, Anthony, this is one of his idols, mm -hmm. and, and, and Lee Bowery is telling Anthony and Joanna that, that, that he thinks they're fabulous. Mm -hmm. you know? yes, okay, so we're, we're, we've now set the stage for this kind of uh, creative environment and friendship and co I'm using the word collaboration. I noticed, Charlie, you don't want to say that you really collaborated with, with Anthony, but you were friends, and aesthetically, Aesthetically, uh, you were on the same terrain. Well, sim similar. I have to say, you know, uh, one of the things, one of the real innovations and uniqueness about Anthony in that world is his lack of irony. Lack of irony? Mm -hmm. ah. and Which is so on his generation. Well, I mean, he, you know, he, when I, st I did start a, a collaboration with him, and I realized that. Well, the first, I have to go back to the very first thing that I saw him in, which was this thing at, at this benefit, and it was him and Johanna and Eve, and he sang the Star Spangled Banner. Um, straight. Straight. And and he had the r words written on his arm, and I thought that was a joke. I thought, That's this a Marsha P. Johnson. This is, this is so hilarious. You know, this is like... And he was that know, serious. And, and, and yet, he, because, of course, he's not really... You know, American. American. It was. It wasn't um, a joke at all. <laughs> he needed it to. Which is a very interesting thing to bring up because in your work, Lucy, one could read it as caricature, mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, I never felt that it came from that place, and that audiences uh, try to understand by using these kinds of. of of filters mm -hmm. which distances them from the real transgressive nature of your work, 
of your work and certainly of Anthony's work. And must have caused, did it ever bother you that people, when I said, oh, that was hilarious, yeah. you know? The only place it really bothered me was <clears throat> uh, in the press. You know, the Times was always very generous to us. They was like Dance Noise. That was the performance duo that I did with Ann Yopes. And, uh, you, and Dance so, Noise was you and? Ann Yopes. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you and should YouTube them because there are some videos of their work and they're pretty fabulous. And I should get more up on YouTube is what I should do. But, um, but anyway, we always got very nice reviews from the Times and who could complain, except that, you know, after 10 years of, of these reviews, everyone still said, you know, oh, well, they're kind of crazy and wacky and it didn't make any sense, but who cares, we had a good time. And I was like, really? <laughs> you know, <laughs> can I not be clearer that we are talking about politics, we're talking about our bodies, we're talking about subjects, you know, we're... We're, we're grappling with these things. We don't mean it to be just being wacky and crazy and who cares. Uh, and they so couldn't that, that, that sort of bothered me. And they couldn't aesthetically uh, assimilate you. Mm -hmm. they, have, they kept trying to, to define what you were doing um, and really what you were doing was not about being defined in a conventional sense, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the things I think that unites all of all the mm -hmm. people we're talking about. Where did Julia come in? Dr. Ju Julia? Yes. Dr. Uh, Yulia Yasuda mm -hmm. um, uh, has performed with Anthony for many years and been a friend of Anthony's for many years, but I don't know much about Julia. Uh, she was someone who was, um, I think Anthony met through various friends in the, in the trans community, and um, um, she, was, she was good. I, I, I don't really know the whole story, so was, I'm probably not telling you right, but I know she was, I know she was friends with Chloe. Yes. And that's how Anthony met her through Chloe. Um, the Dr. Julia, how you, I never said that. We used to live in Fire Island together and I'd always be able to say Dr. Julia, <laughs> <laughs> uh, who was a genius. I mean, a Japanese uh, transsexual um, and a genius and, uh, and an exhibitionist. <laughs> and, and Anthony, with Joanna, these were his, he told me at one point, these were his two muses. Mm -hmm. uh, when everything else became dark, these were his two. Well, when the, when the whole Black Lips thing uh, fell apart and he formed the Johnsons, the, that was the core of the Johnsons, mm -hmm. Johanna, Anthony, and Julia. Now, let's, let's move towards turning. Um, I'm going to ask the producer, how do, you, how do you spin this movie? I'm just still figuring, still figuring that out. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is about turning, but I want to know about spinning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's an interesting thing because it's hard to describe it without going, you know, describing the whole thing. Okay, these women get on stage and they turn on a lazy Susan while Charlie films them, and they get the images mixed, and that was the live show, and then we made a film out of it, and. Uh, they, they include these interviews with these women, and uh, that's what sort of makes the film different than the show. But to be the, the single sentence about it, you know, is, is something about, you know, the power of Antony's music and the power of these women, uh, all of them with very different stories. Um, but for me, all the stories are all moving, and you can relate to them because they are about this struggle to become yourself. To def without anybody else's definitions, right? Joey Gabriel says, I didn't want to be judged. Um, Kembra's out there, Kembra Fowler's in the film, you know, doing Kembra's look, which is full body paint, etc. And she's presenting this as, you know, this is my presentation of myself she's as a beautiful Kali. woman. She is Kali. As Kali. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so I think it's about, and that's why I think it has a really broad appeal, is because it's about how we struggle to become ourselves, and everyone can relate to some portion of that. Well, I have to tell you, I think the film is absolutely stunning and beautiful and moving, and it, it raises a lot of academic and questions which get all pushed to the mm -hmm. side because of the beautiful work that, uh, that Charlie and Anthony have both done. Um, to me, it's a film about gender illusion. Um, it, it, one, the, we, have, we don't yet have a vocabulary yeah. that everyone agrees is the right way to talk about what is going on with gender uh, in, in many communities, particularly the trans-identified community, and, and, and in the art representation of that. So here you are, Charlie, with a mixed bag, oh, that what a terrible way to put it, <laughs> a, a collective of um, female-identified 
uh, subjectively identified with femaleness mm -hmm. uh, and biologically a very mixed group of people. Mm -hmm. And you um, almost treat them, and, and I want you to, to understand this as a positive, mm -hmm. like uh, Vargas girls. They're very beautiful. Uh, you you um, have lit them and they have been made up by themselves or by someone else. By that beauty is becomes very much radiant, including Kembra, who I say is in collie drag. Mm -hmm. Please forgive me, Kembra, mm -hmm. if you don't think that, but I mean, it's stunning. Uh, the, the biological women seem to fade <laughs> a little bit in the conventional sense of what beauty, female beauty is, to the trans uh, women who are in the film. So talk about how you um, you and Anthony talked about the representation of this gender illusion. Well, we had, we had uh, some discussions about it. By the way, I do mean, you agree with, any, if you disagree with anything no, I, I've said... I, I agree with what you're saying, but... Uh, the, the only I'm, thing I would add before you go on to that in terms of what you're saying is, it, it, just because you asked about how I talk about it as a producer, it is really interesting to me that these questions for me, were not considered. It goes first and foremost to these women and how they are talking about their own lives. Okay. And, and then it comes out from there. Which, you're right, leaves all the questions out there for someone else to talk about and, and address. Um, but it's, uh, and, and one of the reactions to the film has been that people do not know is it, uh, is it bio woman, is it trans woman, is it, are they gay, are they straight? That becomes, it becomes a thing, and we don't explain it for each woman where they come from. You may know because you may know some of the women, but it's interesting that for the, for the audience that doesn't know them from New York, uh, they don't, they're not aware. I would suggest to you that the artistic representation and aesthetic representation in the film does allow the audience to know more than you just said. Okay. Um, and I don't think it's based upon personal knowledge. I think that there's such a self-revelation in the humanity of each individual that the question actually doesn't become important, uh -huh. but, uh -huh. it is, but it is present uh -huh. in a visual sense, not in an uh, uh, in intellectual Well, I mean, you know, someone who's very sensitive to these issues obviously sees it in quite a different way. They're looking for telltale signs and, you know, one way or the other. But I didn't treat it that way at all. I mean, I, I treated them all as... I would treat anyone that I would work with as a friend and someone who's I'm interested in, who's beautiful, and I want to enhance whatever that it, they are, they're bringing. How uh, are the, how are the subjects? If I, I'll, I'll put it that way, or, or Justin, Vivian, Bomber want me to say how? I don't know what the plural of V is. Yeah. <laughs> how are they chosen? Uh, in the end, they were you know um, they were chosen by Anthony. I mean. To, represent his music. I mean, we just, we just got, you know, most of them are people that, some of them I've worked with before, and uh, most of them I knew. And there were like two I think I didn't know. At the, and, but every, I brought it, we brought everyone over to my house. I mean, I separately, I brought everyone over to my house just to get stand on a turntable and talk to them and work, you know, just see what, how they would do. But I mean, we didn't, it wasn't really an audition because they were chosen, but just in preparation um, That's people you knew, people Anthony knew, people from. Uh, there are a couple of you know we we, were, we talked about going out to places and find, looking for people and finding people, but we never really ended up doing that. And I knew uh, in my um, that in the end Anthony was going to control that aspect that aspect of it. So I was like, you just choose it. What? There's uh, a beautiful moment in the, a couple of times in the film where. Anthony uh, comes and assures them all uh, to not be nervous, to just be beautiful, you know. To well, that was, the other discussion was how to how they wanted to be represented, and my I think my aesthetic one, which was uh, as they see themselves, not as we see them. You know, I mean, there are certain people. That, it is so much about subjectivity, anyway. Yeah, and and as they should just style themselves, at, at, I mean, will help if they want, but no one really wanted. Um, <laughs> but... Um, Did they help each other? I, some, I saw that in the film. Sometimes I saw they, yeah, they helped each other. But, um, so just as they saw themselves, 
and let them. My only requirement was on the days that we were filming the performance, two days, that they had to look exactly the same, so I could cut. How many shows did you actually shoot? We shot really one, one show and a rehearsal. And where was that show? In, in, at the Barbican in London. The, um, and then a lot of backstage footage from throughout the tour. When yeah. did you do the interviews? The interviews were done in hotel rooms. At the, it was at the very end of the tour when Anthony wanted to do interviews. And so he, he in sort of investigatory way, and um, so very, and the, it was, we did, I mean, it started out with wanting the girls to interview each other, and that, that wasn't producing the results that Anthony wanted. Mm -hmm. That, so he took it over and he interviewed all the girls separately in a way trying to figure out what the piece was for them and what it really was for all of us. Because it was a very, it was a very incredibly positive experience for everyone involved. I mean, a very special moment in time where we all got together and presented this and, you know. Interestingly well, enough for the film is that they, that was not an intention from the beginning to do those interviews. And it wasn't clear at all that those interviews would be part of the film. So it was done really for Anthony's own investigative Well, process. I think that that was a very good choice because I'll tell you as someone watching the film, and I've, I've watched it a couple of times now, um, the illusion is so presented on the, on the wheel spinning mm -hmm. that I did want to know. Yeah. Uh, even the ones I knew, I still wanted to know because they, Anthony and Charlie and, and uh, Lucy, they were treated with such dignity that is not the norm. You know, they were not treated, in my view, as um, something to go, oh, you know, you, the way most people see them. Well, I mean, you know, I have to say the other thing that about the film is that we were approached by television companies ahead of the tour and they were, Channel 4 was interested and they, there was a director who was interested and they were going to let us have a lot of control and finally we real, I realized and Anthony realized also but that we really couldn't give this again that I know exactly what a television company is going to want what they're going to do <laughs> it's going to be exactly what we hate we can't we can't do this so well, we weren't going to do a film until two days before, and, and Anthony's like, we have to do it. We have to do a film. We're going to hire someone. The record co we'll borrow money from the record company. They'll front the money for the for recording it, and that's what we did. So it was really. I can I, and I always thought this this would be a great film, you know, when, what, if we did it. But you know, we were not going to do it until the very end. I can't imagine knowing some of the, the, the business things that Anthony has been through, him allowing anyone else but someone he trusted. So he trusted, he trusts both of you. Mm -hmm. And Anthony, in reality, doesn't trust a whole lot of people until they've really proven their loyalty to him. Mm -hmm. And both of you are in that category. So it made perfect sense to me to see that it wasn't some wonderful person from outside that came in, that, that he, he went with the people that he knew and trusted. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the music, but before I do that, I want to go back to, since you brought up about the outside influences, I know you did a, a video, uh, a music video for Anthony, that, um, th I, what was the song? that? Had, you Are My Sister. You Are My Sister. And, I, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about the first version, and that was rejected by the record company, is my understanding? Well, wow. now, now I have to say, very happily for me, um, that's the version that we're showing, where Anthony's allowing that to show. I knew in the end that was going to be the version that would last forever, you know, but... That's the version in my house. <laughs> but... Uh, but what but, happened? What happened? No, seriously, what I think happened? it was, it was because all they weren't around... Bad it was all around... Um, the issues were all around... Um, <coughs> now be frank here, please. Okay. Um, commercial record company concerns. I mean, there, there were. It was like broad, broad. You know, don't narrow your audience. I mean, they felt that having Boy George in in makeup. I, I don't know. This is. I'm putting words in someone's mouth. I'm, I'm just telling you about how I. I how I, I, I want to know how you and Anthony handled 
a rejection of a project which you put a lot of thought and well, work into. Well, I mean, it was it was me that put the, you know, I mean, it was my idea of how to do this. I mean, it was a very small budget, and I I assumed that um, although Anthony always, you know, at the beginning was like, I don't want to be in any of these videos. I'm, I look horrible, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know how he was always apologizing on the stage for everything he did at the beginning. And still, sometimes <laughs> not anymore. Not as much. <laughs> but. So, so let's go. I, I mean, I really would like to to talk about because Anthony has become a very known uh, performer and and recognized worldwide. And his record company was not a horrible record company, no, and yet this. I think it was the. I think I don't know. It was the publicist. They, you know, the, they reacted that it was. It was narrowing the audience. It was making it, you know, too. Gay specific or whatever. And but so. this is also, and it's also it's some time ago now, right? What oh, time very, is that? Two thousand. Six seven, maybe. Seven. Five. So, I mean, it's, it's worth noting how much has changed even in these last six or seven years but in terms of what, 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 people, what people understand and then what, what people know that there is, you know. My, my question has to do with navigating from this, from this community of support, artistic support, into the commercial world and how, when you were told no, change it. Essentially, I don't probably not in that way. Yeah. How you and Anthony figured out how to how to recut it? Well, I, it was all on me. Okay. I mean, Anthony was really on. He was so they away. dealt with you. I was like, you know, he, it was like, you know, they don't like this. I said, okay, what do you want me to do? And then, you know, and I had spent my, you know, really, uh, my heart and soul was in the first version, really. Yeah. And I then I quit, you know, then I got together, you know, took other footage and, you know, and did fixed it. it. And fixed, fixed it to it, please it, them. And fixed it, and I never liked that version at all. Well, the good, the good news is that the version that people will see, and if they go to uh, any of the social media places that videos are, they most likely will see the original version of it. Well, now, now we're, we're actually on the, on the turning DVD, we're putting the original okay. version. And will all the all the um, the subjects, the fabulous women, mm -hmm. um, are not interviewed that were interviewed are not in the film, correct? Will they all be on the DVD? Uh, there, oh, there's only one uh, one woman who, who um, we had to make we had to make the film shorter. I mean, we couldn't put everything right. in, and so we had to make some choices. And unfortunately, there was one of the women, uh, not for any reason except length that her song was cut out completely because okay. we had I mean and then the end song the you are my sister which closed the thing which um, so we're putting that that song on the DVD okay, so everything will be on the DVD uh, everything you know there will be a representation of all 13 okay. women on the DVD and now let's talk about the music and the collaboration between the visuals uh, in the live performance and in the shooting and in the editing with the beautiful, beautiful music that Anthony, I mean, it really is about his music mm -hmm. that, th that this project came alive. Mm -hmm. So talk how you worked. Well, it wasn't that complicated. I mean, I, uh, as, is, as I'm used to doing in collaboration, I work with who I'm working with. And so it was very, I really, got into Anthony's world. I mean, I, you know, it's not like I've always done beautiful, this kind of beautiful right. images, but it, I thought this is what I thought was totally appropriate for this work. And that's, and I got into it. And, and it was a pleasure to do it live and nerve wracking and fun and everything. But uh, There's one interesting thing that happens with the film, which I know I've heard you guys say, um, is that while Anthony and Charlie definitely chose, you know, this song and this woman when they were doing the live show. They did not know these interviews and these backstories. And it's amazing to me that when you watch the film and you hear some of the information in the, from the, the women's interviews and then see them with the song, it resonates so much. Well, the um, the and Japanese partly, woman, uh, yeah. her backstory and her song, I had never seen her before. What about Sonny? Sonny yeah, Morris. So it was, uh, uh, I was just 
yeah. so captivated yeah. that all the other questions went out the window. Mm -hmm. Just about this, and then hearing the story, yeah. particularly she's the one who most references AIDS yes. and the loss, uh, which I'm, you know, I'm which glad. Which we're so happy to include in the film. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, it's sort of the un, uh, the backstory of so much of downtown New York, right. but you know. The fact that it came out, I mean, again, not on per not, we didn't try to bring it out, and we, and I didn't even know that story uh, about Sonny. I knew she was, she was HIV positive, and she was a trans activist, and, um, but I didn't know the whole story. It's such a, it's such a part of all of our lives, and, and it, and it, and, and it's so humanly moving. The way it's talked, the way she talks about it, uh, and, uh, and also the way it, can, it comes up in the interview. So you don't see it coming. You don't see it coming. Yeah. Lucy, um, you're the producer, so you. So well, you, I, I should explain a little bit about what me being the producer or a producer because we co-produced. Did you with, just write checks? And, uh, <laughs> that's me. Uh, co-produced it with Viva Gavogel in in Denmark, but um, but I, uh, you know, I saw turning. At St. Anne's, I certainly knew of the project because of Charlie and Anthony, but that was that. I didn't have much to do with it. Um, they had filmed it. Um, they had, you know, sort of cut together a version of it, but then they sort of couldn't have enough time to work on it. They didn't have money, more money to work on it. They needed, and so I really come in at the last minute. Um, which was just sort the of last here. several years. <laughs> yeah, it turns into a couple of years. Last several years. Okay. <laughs> but it's only just saying, like, okay, you have a, a, a nearly finished, really beautiful film. Okay. This definitely should be in the world. Can we figure out a way to make it in the world? So, you know, wound up reaching out and collaborating with Bullet Film, who Charlie had worked with before in Denmark, on um, getting some finishing money from them and getting it edited in Denmark. And it was, it was a complicated uh, and had getting commercial, it out, but I commercial just, structure because the record company had loaned us money on the basis of first money in which record company? Rough Trade. Okay. Uh, and Jeff they were Travis. Very, very Jeff gener Travis. generous. Jeff, Jeff Travis. Yeah. 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 So it was just, there was no production company there. Um, they, Rough Trade, as I said, had generously lent them money to film it, but, there, you know, nobody was making the film. So I just kind of have been around in the last couple of years trying to go, okay, well, let's keep this thing moving forward. And, and I'm still working on it now, going, how do we get this thing really out to people so that it can it's be It's interesting that, that it's Rough Trade and Jeff Travis who's involved because Arthur Russell was all our friend. Yes. And it was Jeff Travis who put out that beautiful record of, of Arthur Russell's in, in, uh, on Rough Trade in the 80s um, before people were really aware of that side of yeah. Arthur. Uh, and still... Yeah, I mean, it's I, funny. I, when I saw... I mean, I met Jeff through all this. And then when I was in London, one of the early times, he talked about... I had no idea about his relationship with Arthur Russell. But, you know, he had significant... Um, you know, support for Arthur. There's just been a re-release of Arthur Russell music uh, around in tandem with the uh, Iris Axe movie. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, the the uh, Arthur's a whole other subject that we could, yeah. you know, as people that lived in, in, in uh, and were friends with Arthur. But, it's, but the point here is that that is the same. To me, Jeff Travis has always had the best ears of anybody in the music industry and had a rough time business-wise and survived. And here he is again. And it's um, funny, I've just worked with him on two, two of his artists are working, because I'm working with Michael Clark, and we just had um, Scritti Politi live. A new Scritti Politi? <laughs> oh my goodness. A green singing live yes. um, at, 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 for one act. And then um, Jarvis Cocker singing live for the other act with relaxed muscle. And so Jeff was at both of these premieres, and so it was just funny to see him. And he's shy. Yeah. yeah I mean, he's he doesn't, uh, and he's so supportive of his musicians. I mean, it's incredible. So tonight, Turning is going to be playing as part of Doc New York City, post Sandy. Uh, it's been a really rough time for Doc New York City because it, yeah. it came, it, it's, it's up and running. You know, ten days after the devastation of Sandy, and I their offices uh, were down, their ticket sales were down yeah. up until just a few days ago. Yeah. And I have to say kudos to IFC uh, for sticking with it because it could have very easily been shut down. And there's a lot of I don't word I'm not particularly favorable of because of my age, but there's a lot of queer content um, in this festival. You had the Rufus Wainwright, uh, Martha Wainwright family film last night. There are various other films that are here, but this is. 
but Anthony, it's interesting. Um, my impression of Anthony and his audience is very much like Rufus's. It was not gay-based, although he, mm -hmm. you said the problem was, oh, is this is too gay-centric. But, it, it, you know, you go to an Anthony concert or you go to a Rufus concert, and it's a very mixed audience. I, I've always felt predominantly uh, smart, hip, cool, um, let's call them heterosexuals, if you will, but, but comfortable with, with all of us together. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why I think turning is, it should never be niche marketed, exactly. and I hope that you don't let that happen. And um, in the no, end it's hard. Of, and Andy did say, you know, and it's, it's I really that's what I mean about everyone can relate to it in some way. It's like you know, this is really a film for you know, for housewives in the Midwest, for you know, for 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 a lot of different people. I don't know that I can get it out to them, but that's certainly what I would like to do. Yeah. And it also talks about um, those rigid definitions of gender that are enforced upon people, um, that when people are allowed to be expressive of their own, gen their own gender expression, we, we see this is one representation, this is the gender illusion part for me, of the feminine. And uh, who owns feminine? I mean, females and other whole but who owns that word? And what does it mean? I'm not asking you to, sure. to define that, <laughs> sure. but the film sort of cuts through all of the, you know, noise to the humanity of each of these people, and and I think that Ant and this is what Anthony has always presented publicly with himself, you know, uh, and I think it's a wonderful project that both of you should be very proud to be associated with, and I'm I'm hoping that anyone who who sees this and says, oh, it's not for me, thinks again because it. It's not only because of the content of, around the gender issues, but it's also this incredible, beautiful concert with the, probably the most emotional singer that we have in our generation today, which is Anthony Haggerty. Um, so I'm very... Uh, and it's really great if you can see it in a theater just because of that, because the sound is big enough and the visuals are big enough and you can lose yourself in the music and in the visuals. Who did the... Well, the, the music is what pulls you yeah. in through... Uh, right. it, it, without the music, it would be something else. Um, and we spent a lot of time talking about the visual aspects mm -hmm. of it because it's pretty unique on that level. But it is about the music uh, and Ant Anthony's vision. Um, who did the sound? It sounds so beautiful. I don't know how it's going to sound in this theater. I want to see it at the Walter Reed personally because that is the best sound system. Well, I mean, we've, we had, we've had uh, great screenings. The best screening was at Queen Elizabeth Hall in London where we had the eight, six channel, Dolby, you know, set discrete channels and all that. Um, we did, uh, well, the sound was recorded, you know, by the, when we recorded it, Anthony mixed it here, then we remixed it to the film in Denmark, which we had a great sound person for that okay. also. Is there anything that you, Lucy first, would like to say to artists uh, in this particular economic time where you've always had sort of a business side to you, um, which is unusual, and thank God, you know, uh, but talk about how you as an artist, a creative person, also take care to survive uh, from a business side. And because this is what turning, in a way, says to me is one of the things you've been able to accomplish. You were brought in, I think, probably because, oh, let's get Lucy. She knows how to take care of this kind of stuff. <laughs> I, I certainly uh, was not brought in for money. <laughs> and I haven't done much, much in the way of raising money in terms of the film. Um, I don't know. I really, I, I don't know if this answers your question, but I really like producing. I like, uh, you know, I produce a lot of live events now, whether it's, you know, fundraisers for nonprofits or producing the Bessie Awards for dance awards in New York. Um, and, and it was something I realized that I had been doing with Dance Noise anyway, because as a performing artist with no company behind you, you're producing your tour, you're producing your shows, you're producing it as you go. Um, but it has been really nice for me to realize that, you know, that producing is this really creative process that, and, and the most important thing I can tell you about it is that, and it's why, you know, <laughs> I go to these Doc NYC events and there are all these filmmakers and, oh, you produce documentaries. I'm like, well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've exactly been involved in two films and they were both because of Charlie and they're 10 years apart. Um, but basically, uh, 
the one thing I would say is that if you see something that you really think that should be in the world, then figure out how to make it be in the world. And that's, that's all you can do. And so believing it's possible rather than sure. believing it's impossible. Sure, and only doing it because it's something that you absolutely feel essential should be out there and that should be seen by people. And getting it seen by people is an important thing. It's, 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 it's great to do it in a nightclub for 50 of your friends, but if you really feel like, oh my goodness, this is really powerful and this could be powerful to a lot of people, then then that's worth investigating how you can get it out to more people, and that's... But the that's incubation important. process of the creative work, which you certainly with PS122 and the various night clubs or night art spaces that you work in, gallery spaces you worked in, prepared you for the kind of representation of a, of a, of a, of a piece in a large, for a larger audience, yes or no? Because some people think, I just have to stay home and put video cameras on and make movies sure. and I'm going to put it out in the world. Sure. Well, I think that, I mean, first of all, that it comes from a live event but uh, that I understand. Uh, but I think it's also just understanding, you know, how you work with an artist, <laughs> what an artist has to say. That's something different than, uh, you know, that's why I say about it still with turning. I'm still figuring out what the outside uh, way to encapsulate it is because it still is so much from the inside out and, and as Charlie was saying making sure that the film got made from the inside out you know not how someone else would view these women or Anthony's music or whatever but to say let them define it first then we can figure out what it is after we've made it. I got two questions before we finish Charlie for you one is the secrets of how you uh, at one point in the film I realized one of these people is incredibly tall but when you're when they're on the wheel, mm -hmm. there's n there's no, none of those questions comes into play, and how you sort of dealt with it's sort of the Alan Ladd question, mm -hmm. you know, Alan Ladd was five foot four, mm -hmm. and but you never knew that on the screen. How did you deal with the different physicalities of well, I mean, reality yeah. of the physicality with the fantasy that the individual had of him, of, of themselves? Well, I mean, was it that doesn't come into play too much? I mean, the stages that we performed on were very large. I mean, on this on this particular tour. So the the their actual size of the of the individuals, the variation really didn't matter that much. What people were looking at was really the screen, and they were all the same size on the screen. Yes. So and that's the illusion of film. <laughs> so you know, close. That's the, that's like movie stars with big heads. It's the same. <laughs> but did you have did you have star lighting? No, we had no. The lighting was because it was on a stage. We couldn't really. I couldn't really have this glamour lighting. Uh -huh. So the fact that 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 I was working with fairly low res video helped. What what did you shoot it on? Uh, well, I was doing it on. Um, I was going into my computer and very first version of it was like three twenty by two forty. You know, really small scale video blown up. Uh -huh. um, but when we did the tour, I missed DV cam. It wasn't like high def at all or any, anything mm -hmm. like that. It was all analog video. It was all analog video. Now, this is going to sound crazy. I can't remember if it's in black and white or color. Is it a mixture or is it all well, in no, color? It's a, well, there's, there's some black and white sequences, but it's in color. It's all in color. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about, black and no, white. No, black sequences. and white. Black and white. Stacy's black and white. Uh-huh. The, the video mix behind yeah. Stacy during the film. It's just interesting that uh, that's not a uh, that's not how I see the film. Mm -hmm. I see it in tone. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's really interesting. you know, when some people shoot in color and then drain mm -hmm. everything out, all the color out of it. Um, the other question I have for you, Charlie, is that the, the last couple of years, if, if I'm correct, have, you've really become a major known figure around the world. You've had a number of of, of your gallery museum exhibits of your work. You know, which is what twenty-five or thirty years of work. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have become a, an artist of, of renown, uh, and here you are back with Lucy, who lives around the corner <laughs> from you, and Anthony, who you've been, you know, following and been friends with since since uh, Black Lips. Uh, what does that do to your aesthetic and how you see the world when you become famous? Not anything. <laughs> well, I feel like the, what, what I'm so fantastically 
happy about is that the visual art world discovered Charlie. And that's, is that, is that fair to say yeah. that mo this recent years have been about the visual art world uh, taking Charlie and doing experience, and the visual art world has some resources. <laughs> see, this is, this is a really good example for the audience to see what Lucy's role as producer and Charlie's role as artist, how they, how they <laughs> mesh together, because the artist here is shy. And, and, and Lucy's and, happy to talk to her. And, and Lucy really, uh, and perhaps it was an unfair question for me to put to you, yeah. so, so thank you, Lucy. Uh, but it took a long time to get to this space. It took Anthony a long time to get to this space. Um, and, and, I, and I just would like you both to comment, and this will be the last mm -hmm. question, about how you hold on, um, keep the vision alive, through many years of not getting recognized, or many years of, of trying to figure out how the hell am I going to pay the rent next well, month? The, I mean, the motivating. I mean, I've been very lucky all my through all my career of being being in situations where where I can keep going. I mean, I can make the next piece. That's really all that I care about is making being able to make the next piece. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I'm in the situation where that's sort of, in a way, been being taken care of. But even at, and I was so I was never, you know, when I worked at the beginning with the dance company with Merce, um, I could always, you know, was support. I never had to worry about uh, uh, getting it out there. That was never my concern. My concern was making. And someone else's job was getting it out there, raising money for the next one. So I really was in the incredibly gifted situation in that way. And the kitchen, was that, I always thought of you as sort of home-based at the kitchen. Well, I, I had a lot of years of having projects at the kitchen, but it was nothing, you know, I mean, everything, a lot of the independent work, I, if I wanted to do something different from what I'd done before, I had to do it on my own, always. And I've always wanted to do something different from the last project, so a lot of them are you know, I had to be very motivated to, you know, to getting that Lee project done was really, really a fight. And I'm so happy so that the it Lee, got the Lee, the Lee Bowery, Bowery one. one. So happy that it, it did get done. But, Lucy, uh, I know you have to go. So if you would like to give an answer to how you hold on mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a dark time or when, you know, when space is closing, funding not being available, uh, interpersonal relationships blowing up and falling apart, all those human situations. How does an artist keep their vision? I, the only time I really felt <laughs> in danger of it, the, uh, which was I think probably in my mid-30s, um, uh, all I needed to figure out was that I needed to make money a different way and to stop being angry or mad at my work for not making me enough money to pay the rent and still have to keep waitressing. So I needed not to be waitressing, but then I, you know, the, the, the best thing that I ever discovered was that actually, you know, I could do any job. And artists often can, they can do any job. They can do it really well. And we think we have no skills, and we have a ton of skills. So for me, it may not be everybody's answer, but make my money somewhere else. I always had a good time making shows and making art and always could get that out, just didn't never make me money. When, when you were on one of those cable network... Uh, yes, Home uh, Shopping home, Network is exactly shopping. what saved yeah. me. Home Shopping saved me. Now, what, did you consider True. that performance art or work? <laughs> it is the ultimate performance art, as somebody <laughs> says. Okay, you are on the air live for three hours and you have to talk the whole time. Go. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, and I literally would go from here, or Charlie's house, smoke a joint, go out, do three hours, and then come back and perform at Jackie 60. So, and, and never did the twain meet, never did those worlds meet. So I, I made money, and then I still had a good time doing my shows. I want to thank both of you, your, your artists and, um, and neighbors that I have enormous respect and love for. And, uh, and, I'm, and I think that you, in some ways, have provided the, the, the safety pillow for Anthony as, as he's blown up as the artist that he is. And I, and it's, and I think that the idea of community um, always is important. And, and, and so that those of you who are listening to this, Charlie and Lucy are part of a collaborative community of, of artists, many of them have moved to Brooklyn at this point. I know I can't afford to move from Manhattan, but uh, that, that still exists and that you don't have to be alone. Sure. 
So and I think that's what I'm saying about you can always make your work. Yes, doing work with your friends and for your friends, and that that community in New York is essential and will keep you going. Just and I'm very excited about being. I'm very excited about being in the audience tonight at the SUV Theater on 23rd Street as part of the New York Doc Festival. When turning is seen on the big screen uh, in New York City. But it's also going to be, uh, we're oh, doing yes. a week of screenings at IFC. That'll be November 16th through the 22nd. And those are evening screenings, and there'll be discussions after the screenings. The women of turning and Ch Anthony are going to uh, have a post-screening discussion on the first night. Charlie and Klaus Biesenbach from uh, MoMA are going to talk on Sunday, November 18th. Marina Abramovich and Anthony are going to have a post-screening talk on Wednesday, November 20th. I so a week of screenings at IFC. There are up. two people that I wondered why they weren't in the film. Marina being one, mm -hmm. and the other is Diamanda. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, I'm, I'm just trying to picture the two of them in a room together, first of all. Well, they were, we, we were they, you know, we were all at Meltdown together. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and Diamanda, Diamanda was incredible. I mean, it was one of her best shows. Yeah, Marina did and great stuff. Marina, they're both people I've worked with. Marina, both Marina, I collaborated with Marina and Diamanda. Is there any plans for the films to be released anywhere else other than in New York City? Because people will be able yeah, to see it any place We else? have a series of screenings happening in the UK at the end of November, starting November 25th and going through December 5th. Um, same kind of thing, like special event screenings. Charlie will be there to do question and answers. That'll happen in London, in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, in Brighton. Um, in Leeds and Liverpool, so, uh, but kind of producing them like, you know, like a music tour rather than as a film release. So no San Francisco or well, Los Angeles State? We, we need to figure those out. Um, but they're on the horizon. Sure, absolutely. Right, so everyone should look. I'm sure, you, you know, that you'll be able to find out. Do you have a website for the film? Turningfilm.com. Turningfilm.com. And is anything on, are there any interviews or... Uh, What's on that website? There's uh, press on there. There's uh, press interviews with Charlie and Anthony. Our trailer is on there. Photos from the film are on there, uh, and all of the screenings coming up. It's it's still doing festival screenings in Europe and in America, and then of course as we get uh, more uh, solid screenings all across the U.S., we'll put them on there as well. And for any of you gender kids watching, uh, this is like a film that you have to go see. And any of you parents or lovers or boyfriends or girlfriends of people that transgress the gender boundaries, this is a film to go see. And any of you that really want to hear absolutely gorgeous, emotional, beautiful music, this is a film to go see. Turning is a film for everyone. Thank you. Thanks.